Welcome everyone to the session number 16, Humanizing the WTO, Seeking a Sustainable, Just and Integrative Trade Agenda. My name is Ivan Bartmann and I'm the Senior Program Officer for Trade and Development at the Geneva Office of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, better known and much easier to pronounce as FES. For those of you who may not know FES, we are a German political foundation committed to the core ideas and values of social democracy and we are the oldest one created back in 1925. We are engaged in various forms of political education inside Germany, but more importantly, through our huge network of currently 107 country offices worldwide. Here in Geneva, we are focusing on international developments in the area of trade, human rights, migration and social policy from the perspective of the global south. WTO Director General Okonjo Viala frequently exclaims, trade is about people. Humanizing the WTO will indeed be a key part of making the WTO more impactful and durable, especially since governments are seeking to improve human well-being and to build back better after the COVID-19 pandemic. As a side note, we may want to change the term and stick to build better since recent developments do not look very promising for reaching the end of the pandemic in the near future. The time has come for the WTO to play its role in actively contributing to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals and the incorporation of human rights with special attention to labor and environmental rights. The purpose here is strengthening the coherence within the commitments of global governance, including those on human rights and environmental sustainability. A new narrative for the WTO would have to be placed within this wider context while improving human well-being. Some may argue that the WTO is not quick in doing anything. However, there are promising developments which give hope that some things can change for the better. The example of a potentially innovative platform that addresses specific policy areas is the Trade and Environmental Sustainability Structure Discussion, which demonstrates that the WTO can actually open up to civil society participation in a constructive manner. The objective of today's session is to raise specific ideas with you, the audience, for making the WTO more relevant for people's daily lives, and in particular, the lives of vulnerable and marginalized groups. The session will take the form of a visioning exercise to allow speakers and participants to think outside the box. This session will address mainly the following four questions. Which specific ideas are most relevant and realistic for making the global trading system more ambitious regarding sustainability and equity in the face of 21st century trends such as climate change and the fourth industrial revolution? How can we balance resilience with addressing the status quo and making the necessary changes in global governance? How to balance bottom-up action and local interests with global coordination at the WTO? And how can we make more sense out of these ideas by taking a more holistic and integrated view. Before I'm handing over to our moderator, Andres from CUNO, I would like to express my gratitude to all colleagues and friends at CUNO and the Friars Lalage Institute for Africa at LSE to make this event happen, explicitly to Andres, Joachim and David, and of course to my own colleagues, to Matthias and Hayo. And thanks to IASD for organizing the hub. And thank all of you for joining us today. Andres, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to be your moderator of this session. Thank you, Yvonne, for the introductions. Um, I would like to begin by thanking the IISD and our co-sponsors, the Friedrich Ebert Foundation and Kuno Geneva for convening this timely and important discussion. Thank you to all who are following us online. Um, just for housekeeping purposes, each speaker will be allowed allocated 10 minutes for their interventions, followed by a Q&A at the end of the session. To our audience, please feel free to write your questions and comments in the, in, the, in the chat box, and we will do our best to address them at the end of the session. So when talking about humanizing the WTO and bringing, back, bringing human rights and inclusiveness to the forefront of the multilateral trading system, it is pivotal to hear perspectives of developing and least developed countries. 
So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day, Mr. David Luke, Professor in Practice and Strategic Director at the Firoz Lalji Institute for Africa at the London School of Economics and Political Science. David, the floor is yours. If you could unmute yourself, please. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Andres. And um, uh, let me also uh, add uh, uh, a warm word of welcome as one of the uh, co organizers of this uh, session uh, from the Firoz Laji Institute for Africa, the London School of Economics and Political Science. We're delighted to partner with the Friedrich uh, Herbert Stiftung and Yvonne, I can't pronounce it. Uh, and the Quaker United Nations uh, office uh, in organizing this, uh, this, this session. Let me also uh, greet my co-panelists, um, Maria, Andrea, and Caroline, and it's always uh, a, a delight uh, to um, uh, be with you on, on, on a panel. Uh, now, let me turn to the question that, you, that I'm supposed to address, and it's a very interesting uh, question. And let me begin by saying that today's structures of global governance are uh, obviously being tested by the uh, multifaceted uh, complexity of 21st century challenges, uh, such as, of course, the, um, the current public health emergency, uh, climate change, and pervasive digitalization. Now, although expectations were low for what could realistically be achieved at MC12, its postponement for quite understandable reasons has only delayed the reckoning required at the WTO. Uh, this reckoning is about uh, realigning the multilateral trading system, not only with the new challenges, but also for addressing old grievances, which are the core about enhancing equity under rules in which one size does not uh, fit all. So in the short time I have uh, for, for um, uh, responding to this uh, question, Andres, uh, it's not going to be possible to exhaust the issues, but let me highlight some specific ideas for making for making the multilateral system more ambitious regarding sustainability and, and equity. So first, uh, sustain, sustainability. The multilateral principle of non-discrimination is on a collision course with ambitious climate action. Uh, current ideas on how this collision can be avoided have been usefully summarized in a recent paper by James Bacchus uh, and, uh, uh, and range from horizontal waiver for trade discrimination uh, based on um, uh, carbon and other greenhouse uh, gas emissions, uh, support for trade restrictions based on carbon pricing, support for carbon uh, uh, border adjustment taxes, support for trade disciplines on fossil fuel subsidies, support for green subsidies, a uh, version of which is already built into the agreement on agriculture, and as we know, disciplines for fisheries uh, subsidies, uh, the core of the uh, fisheries negotiations, uh, et cetera. So if this approach is to get anywhere, the multilateral system as we know it will have to be reimagined. The dialogue on plastics uh, pollution where there is a broad consensus does give hope that uh, reimagination re is, is possible. Now, second equity. Uh, a careful reading of the LDC ministerial declaration for um, MC12. Uh, and here, uh, as you'll be hearing from Caroline, um, uh, human rights economics requires that we uh, always go back to the most um, disadvantaged uh, uh, groups and uh, to see what the, the aspirations are and how those aspirations could be aligned. So it, it's, it was good to um, uh, that I looked at the LDC ministerial declaration and what in fact uh, the LDCs are saying. So a careful reading of this um, uh, declaration um, uh, of the LDC group, which by the way includes many African countries, uh, makes clear that the old issues persist and there are uh, in fact some low hanging fruit that are ready for harvesting. The LDCs prioritized uh, universal achievement of duty-free, quota-free, market access at a minimum 97% product uh, coverage, uh, disciplining of non-tariff barriers that keep LDC products out of many markets, the services waiver for LDCs and preferential treatment of LDC services exports, uh, a soft landing for those countries that are graduating from uh, LDC status. Uh, and then in agriculture, the LDC declaration highlighted uh, trade distorting subsidies that are still with us, um, flexibilities for public stockholding and a special safeguard 
mechanism that, uh, which are issues that remain to be addressed. On TRIPS as well, uh, imaginative solutions are required to strike the right balance between intellectual property protection and appropriate flexibilities, such as the, propose, uh, the proposal for a temporary waiver of patents on disclosed information, et cetera, to ramp up production of vaccines and therapeutics to overcome the COVID-19 crisis. One proposal that I was happy to support was a sig as a signatory uh, to an open letter uh, by a group of um, academics and researchers to the chairperson of the WTO LDC group, the chair of the general council and the WTO director general. And this proposal was uh, on uh, GVCs for LDCs. Uh, it's an initiative that's based on work carried out by Alessandro Antimayani and Lucian Senate. It complements the LDC's call for global preferential rules of origin, accumulation, and doubling the share of LDC's in global exports. Just very briefly, under this uh, initiative, WTO members will complement existing preferential schemes based on direct LDC exports with a multilateral scheme that would extend proportional duty-free treatment to the LDC value added that is incorporated in exports across the global economy. This will in effect ensure that LDC value-added exports will remain duty-free throughout their journey along global value chains, thus fitting the made-in-the-world logic that characterize global supply chains. The scheme will rely on the existing customs procedures and documentations, uh, et cetera, which means that the, um, uh, this uh, initiative can be implemented with minimum administrative requirements. Uh, utilizing and extending the usefulness of uh, these current arrangements across GVCs uh, beyond their current use for direct uh, LDC uh, exports. Now, the sustainability and equity challenges in the multilateral trading system are compounded by the fourth industrial revolution, which is uh, rapidly evolving and closing the window for the traditional labor intensive path to industrial de development and economic transformation. The digital economy is significantly and irreversibly transforming value chains, skills development, production, and trade. The African continental free trade area uh, offers African countries an opportunity to pursue trade-led growth through inter-African trade as a driver of regional and value uh, chains. So let me pull these uh, views of sustainability and equity together by saying, that the global trading system must overcome the stalemate between the Doha agenda and the so-called 21st century issues. A new multilateral trade rules are required for the digital economy and the green economy, but this must go together with addressing equity requirements. The special and differential treatment framework set out in the trade facilitation agreement with achievable ad adaptations to the framework provides a possible pathway I know that uh, Andrea and Caroline, who will be speaking next to us, may also have something to say on equity in relation to human rights as a normative framework and the underlying principles of human rights uh, economics. So let me stop here. I'm not quite sure, Andreas, if you want me to go and uh, straight on to the other issue about um, uh, how to balance resilience uh, with addressing uh, the status quo and making necessary changes in global governance. But back to you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, David. And, and apologies for, for not posting the questions. I, I we, we put them in the chat. And please, yes, go ahead uh, yeah. if you can answer that question. Yes, yeah, sure. And, uh, and I'll be very brief. So um, uh, as far as resilience is concerned, African countries uh, in particular, and speaking from an African perspective, uh, need to look, uh, in my view, inward at national and regional levels for building resilience, while also supporting reform of the multilateral trading system. The AFCFTA as a continent-wide trade agreement is of course not a magic bullet, but its impacts could extend beyond the immediate domain of trade reform. If implemented in a forward-looking way, it can help to shape Africa's response to the climate and digital transition in the coming years. It provides a ready-made framework for coordinating green growth strategies among African countries as the efficiency sought from Digital, digitalization become pervasive, uh, uh, the AFCFT can help ensure policy coherence on such issues as uh, data governance, customs duties on electronic transmissions, uh, transparency, um, among others. I'm encouraged that despite the current stalemate at the WTO, 
some African countries are taking part in the joint statement initiatives. In fact, all the GSIs include a smattering of African member states. And I think this is significant for two uh, uh, reasons. Uh, first, the African GSI participants can share their insights with the African group, which is the coordinating body of the WTO African member states. And second, these insights can inform related organization, related negotiations, sorry, at the level of the AFCFTA, particularly as regards services, electronic commerce, investment, and the protocol on women and youth, which encompasses MSMEs. But it should also be acknowledged that the global frameworks and institutions will necessarily be limited. A lot of the focus will have to be on national and regional action on climate change and the digital economy. But overall, I am hopeful and I'm a normally a, an optimistic person anyway, that um, the AFCFJ can provide an overarching framework for the collaborative efforts that are needed um, uh, by African countries uh, in addressing these uh, issues while also contributing to the necessary changes um, in uh, global governance at the level of the WTO in addressing uh, these uh, new uh, challenges. So let me stop here uh, and we're conscious um, that uh, the time that we have uh, needs to be guarded preciously. Thank you. Thank you, David, for sharing your 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 vast experience with us, and and you touched upon various uh, very important very important subjects and the priorities of the LDCs. You touched upon the the African uh, Af African continent free trade uh, agreement, and the and the joint statement initiatives, which is, you know, plurilaterals are are an important part of how to advance the work uh within the wto uh you know that that the insights in 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 this in this fora can inform the pol the trade policy and protocols at the ac fta level and so thank you very much for sharing your knowledge in that regard and now um i would like to to introduce our next speaker maria andrea echazo aguero um andrea is a human rights office at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, and Maria Andrea, I would like to ask you a, a few questions. First of all, how to balance bottom-up action and local interests with global coordination at the WTO? And also, and how can we make sense, uh, more sense of, of these ideas that have been presented by taking a more holistic and integrative uh, view? Over to you, Caroline, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, very much, Andres, and, and thanks uh, for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here sharing the uh, panel with, uh, with you and to exchange some ideas uh, about the interlinkages between the human rights and, and trade. And to address mainly your, your second question, uh, Andres, about the holistic perspective and also the theme of this session. Um, so for us, humanizing for humanizing international trade, we need a human rights-based approach. This means using the lenses of the human rights to place people back at the center uh, of trade and for trade to become a real engine uh, that contributes to the promotion of the sustainable development. And as the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and we can keep the previous one, uh, but um, as uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, we have a broad mandate uh, to promote and protect human rights throughout the world, around the world, including the right to development. And in this context, uh, for several years, uh, the office has been working on issues related to trade, investment, and human rights, with a particular focus on human rights impact assessments of trade agreements. And the, the reason being, and then we can now go to the next slide, uh, mainly because uh, human rights uh, and international trade and are closely interrelated. International trade may advance uh, human well-being and the realization of human rights. For instance, it uh, can offer tremendous opportunities for increasing uh, the available resources for states to invest in social policies. While at the same time, uh, trade liberalization may have some adverse uh, impacts, and particularly on the rights of marginalized uh, populations. 
Um, and the second um, main reason why the office has been working on, on, on trade issues is that human rights offers a holistic and integrated perspective to trade policies. By placing these trade policies in an overall context of the state's obligations vis-a-vis -vis human rights to protect, to respect, and to fulfill human rights, and the state's duty to cooperate with each other in ensuring uh, development and eliminating the obstacles to it. And the third um, main reason uh, is that human rights also provide legal standards, a legal framework that would guide states' interventions and also tools like the human rights impact assessments that the states and stakeholders can use to identify, to prevent, mitigate, and address possible negative impacts of trade policies or agreements on human rights, particularly on vulnerable populations. So let me briefly um, go through the two main, the last two main points and, and share then a practical experience uh, about the, the African free trade area. So human rights perspective helps analyzing um, trade agreements in a holistic manner by going beyond the trade policy. So we will not only focus on the trade policy, but we will consider how the state's obligations under certain trade agreements might have an impact on the state's ability to fulfill its human rights. That is to say whether the provisions of the agreement may limit in a certain way the state's uh, fiscal and policy space to comply with human rights obligations. Secondly, we will look at what are the measures that the states and other actors need to take in order to ensure positive impact, including the fair distribution of the benefits that would originate from an expanded trade, um, particularly in the most vulnerable groups, and to avoid negative impacts. And also what are the act, um, actions that the states may uh, take to mitigate any uh, negative impact that may occur. And a human rights-based approach uh, makes a, a big focus on the participation of affected populations and, and different communities, including indigenous uh, peoples and other um, civil society organizations, trade units, uh, unions, uh, other populations that may, be, uh, may result affected by a trade policy. So I said also that uh, we have um, human rights norms and standards. Uh, so the, the whole range of those norms and standards are mainly contained in the core human rights uh, treaties and human rights instruments. And there are a number of human rights bodies, uh, for instance, the, the committees that, that are human rights monitoring bodies of um, human rights treaties that assist uh, states in interpreting uh, its human rights obligations. But we also um, have tools available like the human rights impact assessment, which helps uh, identify and mitigate the impacts of trade. Uh, um, of human rights. And um, there are the guiding, guiding principles on human rights impact assessments of trade and investment agreements, uh, which uh, are very useful guidance on how and when to develop a human rights impact assessments. And um, they uh, recommend, for instance, that um, states undertake such assessments prior to uh, entering into uh, an agreement in order uh, for the state to identify whether the, such agreement would impose or not any obligation that would be inconsistent with its human rights um, ones. And one example um, where we apply this, uh, this framework and, um, and this um, uh, approach uh, and the tool was in, in a process that went from 2014 to 2017 where uh, our office jointly with the Economic Commission for Africa and with Friedrich Ewald Stiftung commissioned an ex-ante human rights impact assessment of the African continental free trade area. This research was commissioned to and based on the work of four experts, including Caroline present here. And it involved a multidisciplinary team of experts um, of human rights experts and trade experts from the three institutions, uh, including a broad consultation with specialized agencies and civil society academics. And the, the focus of this, uh, or the main purpose of this human rights impact assessment was to identify which were the core areas uh, where the Africa free trade area could promote or undermine human rights. 
and to pro promote, uh, provide some uh, policy recommendations to the negotiators on the content of the agreement, as well as on in shaping the monitoring uh, and implementation mechanisms. So in, in our view, the, the human rights impact assessment had uh, three main areas. One is to uh, uh, highlight the distributional impacts that uh, the, it was reasonably expected that the trade liberalization would have, particularly on specific populations. So um, while recalling that all uh, human rights are interdependent and interrelated, um, the team uh, focused the assessment on the particular uh, impacts on, on the right to, to work, on social protection, uh, adequate standard of living and the right to food of uh, a certain number of populations like the women, uh, small scale farmers and informal cross-border traders. And uh, by doing this, uh, uh, the, the report made visible the situation of these populations who would uh, have been left uh, out of the focus if uh, the focus remained in the, more, um, in the main sectors on, on average me measurements. So um, the, the report also stressed the need and the importance of having access to disaggregated data, for instance, on the situation of women in the informal cross-border trade and to understand um, the differentiated impact uh, that specific measures would have in certain groups in order for states to adopt some targeted measures. And it also emphasized the role and the contribution of women uh, in trade and their specific needs. And the third main area uh, where I see the contribution of this uh, exercise is that it identified that complementary measures would be required uh, when implementing the, the free trade area and that states had to ensure the policy coherence um, between human rights and the trade obligations, but also the, the space uh, for undertaking and fulfilling uh, its obligations, and that they had to plan carefully the implementation of the free trade um, area and the free trade liberalization. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in, uh, we believe that the recommendations from this uh, assessment are particularly relevant in the context of the initial implementation of the free trade uh, agreement, which started trading uh, early this year, and also in the context of the COVID uh, crisis, uh, the environment and the triple planetary crisis um, that the world uh, lives today. And in this context, we, as an office of the High Commission for Human Rights, we have strengthened our collaboration internally and with external partners. Uh, and we are planning uh, additional activities in support of the AFCFTA, so follow up to the recommendations. And also, um, we are planning to update uh, the recommendations to uh, undertake additional um, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary discussions on specific themes uh, like uh, free trade and environment protection and climate change and other topics that would be uh, discussed during the next round of negotiations that very much relate to human rights like intellectual property, investments, e-commerce. And we also uh, we are also identifying opportunities to support the Secretariat of the FTSA, AFCFTA in developing a gender and use protocol. And all these efforts um, are part of uh, the overall uh, work of the office to promote international cooperation and solidarity and partnerships to address the increased inequalities that uh, affect and are closely related to uh, people's enjoyment or lack of enjoyment of human rights. And so we'll um, continue working on in, in bringing a human rights approach or lenses to, to the economy, particularly uh, assisting the states in um, having more coherence in the, the, in the relationship between the social policies and the economic policies, and also in identifying uh, different ways where um, the states can maximize uh, the resources that are available for advancing human rights, for instance, through um, applying a human rights approach to uh, the budgeting process or to um, procurement, state procurement, and in the, for instance, development of uh, human rights indicators. And I will have also some ideas uh, on human rights and economy, but uh, 
I will leave them for, for later after Caroline's presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, you know, you, you highlighted the trade policy can have detrimental impacts on human rights and, and particularly on the most vulnerable and often marginalized groups. And the human rights Im, uh, impact assessments on, on trade agreements are crucial. And I believe they are crucial before any country or each region undertakes the steps necessary to, to enter into this, this agreement, because this can bring coherence between international human rights law and trade policy at the local, um, regional, but also within the multilateral trading agenda. So I think this is this is crucial to highlight. Um, and now, um, if I may introduce our next speaker, um, Ms. Carolyn Domen. Uh, Carolyn is a senior associate with the Economic Law and Policy Program of the International Institute for Sustainable Development. And Carolyn, um, I would like to ask you, taking stock of what has been said and presented by our distinguished speakers. Um, you know, how we can we make more sense out of these ideas by taking a more holistic and integrated view in, in this regard, of course, with your expertise in, in human rights, economics comes to comes to mind. Please, Carolyn, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. And let me join um, the others in thanking the organizers of this session. It's a real pleasure to be here and to um, share ideas with the previous speakers and I hope the audience afterwards. Um, and yes, I think probably my remarks will go um, address the first question that was posed, which is which specific ideas um, um, can help us address in an ambitious way the challenges that um, the trading system is facing in terms of sustainability and equity. Um, human rights economics is an idea I've been thinking about a lot and I think it's definitely relevant. Is it realistic? I hope so. So basically what I want to do today is to step back and share ideas about how a different focus of economics can um, open the way for a sustainable, just and integrative trade agenda. Um, and I say trade agenda, I, I must say that um, it's unsurprisingly I've heard over the last couple of days of sessions during this hub, how people seem to be talking about the international trade system rather than the WTO itself. So whether it's WTO or not, um, I think we want the trade system to be more um, sustainable, just and integrative. So um, human rights economics, um, what is it, you may ask? And I must say, um, if we could have the first slide, please. Um, yes, this is the question that I, with others, are, are asking. And the reason we're asking this question is really to articulate um, what the concept of human rights economics would involve. And the idea of this is to really embed um, human rights in economics thinking. We've heard about you know, human rights and issues or rights-based approaches to, and we really want to get towards uh, thinking about how to actually embed human rights principles into the economics itself. So the starting point um, of this project is, as it says on the slide, is, um, that, uh, well, no, sorry, I should to back, back, back up a bit. Um, the, the starting point of the project is that economics as currently practiced and the economy as currently designed is not doing as good a job as we would want it to. And whether we want it to, whether from a human rights perspective or from other perspectives, such as environmental, sustainable, um, and other um, social considerations. So the human rights economics inquiry follows from two observations. The first is that the human rights community, although it's very effective at influencing many areas of policy around the world, it hasn't been similarly effective in engaging with economics and in economics, including trade policy. And given that our topic today is trade from now on, when I refer to economics, I will mean those features that we engage with in trade policy. So the second observation motivating this project is that different branches of economics exist that we've heard of. Um, and these different branches have provided insights into elements of thinking of the real world that mainstream economics has tended to ignore. So if we take the example of behavioral economics, this is a, a field that emerged probably we could say from the 1960s, but was recognized with a Nobel Prize more recently in 2002. Behavioral economics studies the effects of social, psychological and other factors on economic decisions. 
And its key insight is that economic man is not rational. So that means, you know, in other words, people behave differently from how economic theory says they will behave. Um, and that insight, bringing this insight to light, yields useful results in that it helps make economics more relevant to the world we live in. And this is um, you know, the kind of um, pathway that um, I'm going on in the thinking of the, about human rights economics. What are the human rights specific elements that we need to bring to light for um, economics to be um, uh, to respond more to these sustainability and equity uh, concerns? Um, so let me just give a couple of examples. I don't know which slide we're on. If we can go to the next slide. Um, a couple of uh, examples that human rights brings to light and that could and should be firmly embedded in economics are accountability and what I'm calling um, for the purposes here today, disaggregation. So accountability, I, mean, I think everybody familiar with human rights will know that this is a central human rights principle. And in the human rights context, as like other contexts, accountability can um, refer to two types of things. One is actually accounting for one's actions. How did, you know, how was a policy formulated? What were the elements um, put into the pot when the particular um, policy was being um, formulated? And the other side of accountability is to have a form of, of redress in a sense. Um, to, to, to being held accountable in cases of damages. This, you know, the, the clearest case of that is, say, a court case, you know, that, that you, you, you cause injury to someone you're brought to court and you're held responsible, accountable for those damages. So realizing accountability, as we understand it in the human rights framework, requires mechanisms to know how an economic policy has come into being. And this will require transparency and often participation in economic policy processes, which is a point that Andrea has, has touched on. And on the other hand, um, it will also require effective and accessible mechanisms for redress, um, such as for holding economic actors to account if an economic policy has produced undesirable effects. And I should say here, I'm, I'm just talking about um, governments. You know, obviously, there's also the um, private actors who have um, you know, influence on economic outcomes, but today I'll, I'm, I'm just really focusing on the, the, the governmental uh, aspects. So economists listening to us might think about accountability and say, hmm, that resembles the economic concept of incentives. Um, and I think this would be a, a, an interesting point to have a conversation between economists and human rights lawyers or human rights practitioners. Incentives require that there are clear objectives to be met, that there's a reliable way of assessing whether the objectives have been met and that consequences exist, both for the case where the objectives have been met and when they haven't. And if we consider a current example, I think, I mean, David sort of alluded to this example, we know that lack of governmental action to reduce climate carbon emissions is impeding enjoyment of human rights in many parts of the world. And we know to a large extent what needs to be done. Governments know what needs to be done. And some of these things can be done in the trade policy field. So if the governments don't do it, how do we hold them accountable? If anybody has an answer, please post it in the chat. This is, I think, an open question. We, we, you know, we, time and time and again, we see consequences. We know what needs to be done. It's not done. And there is simply no way um, of holding uh, states accountable. The human rights field does offer some mechanisms for individuals or non-state actors to go beyond the state to claim redress, but these are not sufficient and impunity is an even greater problem in the area of economic policy and economic rights than for civil and political rights. So in this sense, the consequences aspect of incentives is completely absent. And so this prompts us, if we think about human rights economics, to look at other aspects of accountability. How should one how can we make states account for? And in French, we'd say rendre compte de. This is the problem with the word accountability. It's very useful in some terms, but other languages have different words to um, express the different elements of accountability. But anyway, human rights insists on states' accountability for efforts, that is the obligations of conduct, as well as for results. So human rights hold states um, responsible, accountable, not for just for undertaking the appropriate policies or achieving the desired outcomes, but also for the effort. And this, I think, really goes to the point that Andrea was saying about human rights impact assessments, for instance. In the trade context, that would be a prime way 
for a state to discharge its responsibilities of accountability for showing how, how it had considered the risks and benefits of a proposed policy. Caroline, if I may, um, yes. if you can wrap it up in like a minute or so, that would be yes. great. Thank you so, so much. And anyway, I was just coming to that, that, that point and actually that I was gonna say that the report on the AFCFTA that Andrea just presented has a whole chapter on monitoring, which is an essential element of accountability. And the other point that I won't go into in great detail is this disaggregation point, the distributional equity point. Macroeconomics tends to focus on aggregates um, when there are disaggregations, for instance, um, David mentioned and Andrea both mentioned the AFCFTA, there was a lot of discussion about the distributional impacts, but that tended to be distributional as between countries. Human rights would look at distribution as within countries. Its entry point is who is the most mar marginalized, who is the most vulnerable. And this is the process that we have underway, thinking about how to more clearly express maybe half a dozen principles such as these two that I've mentioned today in such a way that they can be more closely embedded in economics and give rise to a branch of economics called human rights economics with which human rights thinking can more clearly um, interact and influence um, economic policy making. So we have a website, if we go to the next slide very briefly, um, and it's a possibility um, through that website for people to share um, share views. As I say, this is really a, an idea that's being developed, that's live at the moment. So um, feedback and comments are very welcome indeed. Thanks. Thank you very much, Carolyn, for your presentation. I think um, this bridges to, to one word that I've been hearing throughout the session as well, which is the segregated data. And I, I, I really think that the human rights economics is grounding the use of disaggregated data with the the human nature it, it really it, it makes human rights more relevant to the human context and so i think it it it, it is very useful to to think it that way thank you very much and now we open uh, the session for for q a for um in the chat i see a question and and if please and if you feel called to answer um, any of our distinguished speakers. Um, I see, I missed, uh, there's a view that bringing certain rights into trade agreements, example, a provision on privacy inside an e-commerce agreement is a way to advance human rights. Others hold the view that by doing so, we would be subordinating the right to privacy to the logic of trade agreements, which is to promote trade liberalization. In other words, the main goal is not to protect privacy, but to find less trade restrictive possible, possible way to uphold privacy. Is, is including rights in trade agreement positive or a shot on the foot? Are impact assessments a better way forward? So who would like, is one of us to answer this? Andrea, do you want to say something or shall I jump in? Andres, how would you like to take this? Uh, we, we, whomever wishes to, to, to go first and uh, if you if you would like to go ahead, Carolyn. Okay, yeah, no, um, this, I think this is an excellent question and does, you know, this is exactly the kind of question that comes up when we talk about human rights in the trade context. And I think, I wouldn't say it's either or, human, you, you posed the question at the end, you're saying, or is, is um, impact, well, you didn't say or, but are impact assessments a better way forward? I would say impact assessments are necessary anyway. You know, that's, you know, for me, that point is closed and dealt with. Then the question of, is it, I think maybe if I can reformulate your question as I understood it, is it desirable to have human rights protections in trade agreements? Um, and the thinking on this has evolved hugely in the last few years. And I think, you know, before you couldn't even talk about it and now you can. Um, I think there can be positive aspects, but there are also dangers. And let me point out um, two areas of danger. One is that one tends to look to the trade arena to, in a sense, enforce the human rights or to sort of as a way to, to, to express these human rights. And, you know, sometimes it may be done for genuinely public interest reasons. Sometimes I think it's actually protectionism in disguise, but um, assuming it's for good reason. My question is, um, and this is perhaps a question to Andrea picking up on, on one of the points that you made, is whose role is it to protect human rights? 
Is it the trade system's role to protect human rights or is it the international multilateral human rights system? My answer would be it's the human rights system. It's the office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights who should be the custodian, the guardian of human rights and who should be speaking up for what these rights are and, um, and, and ensuring that they're um, you know, defended and spoken for and spoken out for. Um, if we do have human rights and trade agreements, you know, in some cases it can very much make sense. Um, you know, it's not necessarily bad. And I think it's good to remind, um, for instance, in a trade agreement, and I, I, perhaps you were thinking about discussions on e-commerce and privacy concerns. Um, yes, it's good in a trade context to remind you know, contracting parties what the relevance rights are, because we know that we're all, we tend to know our field of work better and trade negotiators may not know the human rights world. So yes, it's good to remind uh, negotiators that privacy is a human right, that you know, other elements, we talk about a lot about trade and gender, women's rights are human rights and should be acknowledged in trade agreements. But we must be very careful about that, what that means for I think the global multilateral system. If we put all the rights, you know, sort of, it, it, we see that in, in, in um, the bilateral or regional free trade agreements, that um, you know, sustainable development concerns are put in a separate chapter, all of a sudden that's supposed to be overseen by that trade agreements monitoring or, 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 or you know, uh, institutional system. Is that the right way forward if we think about a, a multilateral system that has different issues at its heart? Thank you very much, Carolyn. Andrea, would you like to contribute? No, thanks uh, a lot and um, thanks for Caroline to, to kick you off. Uh, um, just on, on, on your point about uh, who is responsible for protecting and promoting human rights. So I think it's a very important question. And, and of course, we have the, the, the states as main duty uh, bearers of, of this responsibility. So I mentioned at the beginning, no? so to promote, to protect, and to respect human rights. But on the other hand, um, we also have uh, the states' uh, duty to, to cooperate with each other, which brings us to the international dimension. And that's uh, very well uh, embraced in the, in the right to development and in the Declaration of the Right to Development of 1986. So I, I, that's um, a very important uh, discussion, particularly now, uh, very relevant because it's um, um, the, 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 the Human Rights Council is discussing uh, um, legally binding instrument on the right to development, uh, which includes uh, clearly provisions, which are the um, obligations that the states have to uh, not only uh, enforce uh, the human rights internally, but also to contribute to the development of, of others and not to, uh, and, and also uh, in overcoming you know, the different uh, obstacles and that brings to, for instance, how uh, do they uh, behave or interact at the international level, for instance, in the WTO or discussions over access to uh, technologies or, or that could um, help uh, uh, states to guarantee the right to health. Uh, so um, we as uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights are the main um, UN agency with the mandate to, to promote and protect. Uh, and we assist, let's say, uh, uh, states to do so. And, and also um, have uh, advocacy actions with uh, the international organizations as well. And so we also have a mandate to uh, help other partner organizations to have this uh, human rights perspective. You know? uh, in when, when looking at, um, at their own um, specific thematic areas of specialization. Um, I don't know, um, there was another um, question, but well, I will stop here and uh, give to David if he wants to compliment. Or... Thank you very much, Andrea. And I hope, Marilia, um, there is more clarity on, on your question. David, would you like to contribute? Um... There is also uh, one, yes. Yes, uh, well, you know, I think let's probably move on. I see a, a question in the chat that says, um, uh, concretely and specifically, what does the duty to cooperate in development mean in the context of the WTO, special and differential treatment provisions, aid for trade, etc.? cetera? Um, 
uh, yeah, of course. Um, you know, I think uh, the reason why we have the WTO is that uh, we do need a, a global framework um, for um, tr for trade rules that would apply to everyone. But as I said in my in 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 in, in the in my intervention, um, you know, one size cannot fit all uh, because you know you have um, different situations, countries that are in different circumstances. You know, I mean, as a result of uh, where we are, the, uh, you know, historical legacies and, and so on. Uh, so you, you have this situation. And, and um, the, uh, uh, the way that uh, this has been dealt with in the multilateral trading system is through some special and differential treatment uh, provisions, um, uh, which in effect mean a sort of derogation from the general uh, rules. Now, of course, this is contentious as to um, the uh, shape and the and, and, and the way in which uh, derogations are to be designed and, and so on, and uh, who are to be the beneficiaries, etc. Especially where you have uh, a hierarchy and gradations of um, of countries in, in different uh, situations. Of course, that that remains contentious. But um, I think also that. Uh, one of the benefits of bringing in the human rights perspective, as you've heard from both uh, Caroline and, um, and Maria Andrea, is that, um, you know, it uh, does um, ask us to go back to these basic uh, questions about uh, accountability. I quite like the way um, uh, Caroline uh, framed it. And uh, also um, these um, basic questions of uh, what is uh, fair, what is equitable, and, and so on, you know, these are not easy um, issues to deal with and to find practical and concrete uh, solutions to. But nonetheless, I think um, uh, we, you know, this is uh, where we need to, uh, where we need to be. We need to be working on, on these issues and trying to see where we can uh, make um, some progress in terms of bringing, uh, uh, generating consensus and, and, and so on. And we do have the tools for that. Uh, I tried to illustrate in my intervention various ways uh, we can do this, uh, the uh, trade facilitation agreement and its approach to um, uh, s and uh, There are ways of um, still improving upon that, uh, but we, you know, I mean, there, you know, it's, it's not an impossible task. Uh, there are ways of, of, of doing it. Over to you, Andres. I think you're muted. Thank you so much, David. And there is another question in the chat that relates to the, there is no one size fits all approach, um, which is, you know, the pathways for the transition to more inclusive and greener economy cannot be the same for developed uh, for developed countries and developing countries and the least developed countries. So if if they're asking for the speakers to share their views on that. Perhaps, Karen, you would like to, to, to take a shot at it and... Absolutely, thanks. I'm also looking, there's a new um, uh, question about the supply chains, um, which actually I'm not familiar with per se, but I would say any um, provisions like that, that um, that you know have a sort of inbuilt accountability system. Um, I think could definitely be positive, um, and we know that you know that supply chains are probably even more um, you know influential now than than individual any actions that an individual government can take. So I, I'm not familiar with that law, but um, but um, interesting. I look forward to hearing more about it. About the question about um, different countries will have different abilities and different pathways towards um, you know, sustainability or, or, or green growth or whatever we want to call it. Again, my, my question, um, my, sorry, my answer to this would be, if the economic system provides the right incentives, then that will sort of provide the answers for each, um, you know, for each country. And I know it sounds vague at this stage, and that's because we haven't you know, I'm at the early stages of this process, so I haven't drilled down to say, well, how would we actually embed this, um, you know, the, these human rights concepts into economic thinking, you know, how would we do the you know, mathematical modeling if that's, you know, what would be needed. But certainly I would say that, well, just from a general human rights point of view, yes, different countries should have different obligations in human rights. We do have a very strong 
um, you know, framework for talking about international responsibilities, um, international cooperation, um, which recognizes the different abilities and, and different stages of, of development and different, you know, cultural, social situations of countries. But I, I wish my short answer from a human rights perspective would be if the economic incentives are right, then the right you know, that will help guide the way to the, the solution that's best for the country in question. Um, if I may, I would hey, like to- Thank you to, very much, Caroline, please, Andrea. Yes. To add some points to this about the, the, the question on one, I mean that we, we don't have a one, one size fits all model and that's, I, I fully agree with this. And, and for us, um, a very important uh, way to uh, to really um, have um, a develop um, development model that fun functions for your uh, context is uh, participation. So really having um, open uh, ways for different groups and communities to express the, their needs, so that we we can identify the differentiated needs and impacts, as I mentioned in my presentation, but also. Um, we can have more targeted uh, policies, including some um, that would uh, intentionally promote you know, the, the, the participation and the enjoyment of uh, the rights of certain groups that have been marginalized. So that, I mean, that the, the, there is the state's obligation to improve the, the enjoyment of human rights of mainly of these groups. You know? um, so that I, I think that participation uh, for us is, uh, is, is key. Thank you very much, Andrea. Would you like uh, uh, David to, to continue your contribution? Uh, yes, um, uh, I, I, yeah, I will, I'll um, just make a comment on the, uh, the question in the chat about the, um, uh, the German law um, on supply uh, chains. I'm not familiar with all the details of, of the law, but I, I do, um, understand that it has partly to do with labor standards, um, child labor in the supply chain and um, uh, such uh, practices. And I think the question is saying whether this could be uh, scaled up to the multilateral uh, level. Um, well, we don't all know what happened the last time that uh, there was an effort to bring um, uh, labor standards uh, into WTO uh, discussions. Um, but uh, I, I think, um, you know, uh, for um, where the uh, WTO is at now, and um, and and you know, clearly uh, need for new and fresh ideas as to how to move the multilateral trading system forward. I think um, this question that has been raised is uh, is a suitable candidate uh, for serious consideration. Um, in you know, as as, as we also look at. Um, uh, the WTO in, re in regard to uh, the green economy, to digitalization, to uh, con uh, enduring issues of equity and so on. Um, uh, so yes, I think this is something that needs to be looked at. Uh, we know that, um, and you have seen that, uh, that the Americans uh, are very much um, uh, interested in this uh, issue. Um, they're looking at trade agreements and how trade agreements that have entered into impact, um, as they put it, the middle class, uh, but what they mean is workers and, and you know, and, and, and so on. Um, so I, I think that this is an issue that, uh, yes, that does require to be scaled up and, and to be looked at in the context of, um, uh, as I put it in my intervention, trying to reimagine a new WTO that can deal and, with these issues and be relevant. Uh, to these issues. And in this context, of course, the uh, African countries uh, would have an interest in this. I think um, we want to ensure that uh, supply chains, uh, 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 you know, do benefit um, uh, uh, communities uh, 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 across the, um, uh, the the chain. And I think that this is a, in, indeed a, a, you know, a candidate, as I say, that is worthy for um, further attention. Thank you, David. The floor is, is, is your turn, please. Thanks, yes. Um, and in a sense, I have a, um, a question to ask David in, in response to his point about um, bringing labor standards into the WTO. And, and my question would be, um, but shouldn't, again, in coming back to this point that I made earlier, shouldn't the 
place for human rights be the human rights bodies? And in fact, wouldn't the business, the Treaty on Private Private Business Actors and Human Rights be the place to um, protect and, and be able to enforce that? You know, do we need to look to the WTO or would it be as strong to, to have it in the human rights um, framework? So that's a question um, back to you, David. Uh, yes. <laughs> Colin, I would say you need both. Uh, actually, it's not one or the other. Uh, you know, I think um, uh, Maria Andrea, you know, eloquently um, uh, charted the responsibilities of um, the Human Rights Commission in in this area and the way that it works and and so on as a custodian of uh, global uh, human rights um, uh, commitments. And and I, I think that aspect remains uh, important. Um, now, where trade intersects with um, human rights, including in this instance, in relation to this question, um, uh, you know, labor standards or, or trade intersects with um, uh, climate um, or trade intersects with um, a number of equity issues. Uh, I think also there is a role for the WTO uh, there. Um, you know, traditionally, uh, the view has been that um, uh, the WTO sh should only focus on, on trade, core trade uh, issues. But now it's, it's clear that um, the core trade issues do impact all these other uh, aspects. And, um, you know, we cannot uh, be blinded uh, to, uh, to this, to, you know, to the, to the range of uh, impacts and the uh, consequences of these uh, uh, impacts. Um, so I think, um, uh, in all of this also is a question of uh, how uh, the global uh, governance uh, framework also um, works. And, and here, it's not only the WTO that has broken down. I think um, global governance itself uh, needs, um, you know, sort of to be imagined uh, for um, the world in which we're in, this uh, 21st century world, um, in which uh, really you cannot have all these organizations operating in, in silo. But there has to be a stronger uh, uh, collaborative, collaborative, co coordinated or collaborative uh, framework would be my, my, my thinking here. Does that help, uh, Caroline? Yeah. Uh, since we have the floor, let me just uh, say that I find this approach to human rights economics very interesting. I think offline, it's something that we should engage on, on more. Um, yeah, and I think you, you may have something there. That, um, uh, that that uh, yeah could bring some new and fresh uh, insights. Thank you very much, uh, David, and I, I hope that that clarifies. Now um, we just received a, a a really good question in the chat box, um, and if anyone feels compelled to answer, please do so. So it is the right to act to access to a clean environment was recently adopted by the Human Rights Council. How could this ring? How how could this right to a clean environment be better ensured through the global trading system? Could WTO and OACHR collaborate more more closely on this? What should governments do? Perhaps um, Daniela, uh, Andrea, you would like to take a stab at it. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, and uh, I think that yeah, this is a very important uh, question. And as you know, the the there was. Uh, Recently, this resolution uh, clearly uh, recognizing the right uh, to clean environment, uh, which was uh, um, partly um, an effort uh, from, from the office with a broad range of grassroots organizations. And so um, yes, I think that it would be uh, very important. And this is something that we are trying to do, so expand our partnerships with different uh, actors, and including with the WTO and uh, with UNCTAD and other uh, big uh, players in, in, in the area of trade and the trading system. So um, we are a small team, but we, this is uh, really the, one of the aims, and also um, to be more engaged in, uh, in what Carolyn presented, like the, the human rights uh, economics. Uh, so trying to also um, shape the concept internally and see how we can best uh, uh, contribute to this. Um, uh, we, I mean, the, the High Commissioner uh, has been very vocal and actively participating in the COP26 uh, with, uh, um, yeah, helping the, the states to, to remind of their obligations to uh, have um, really um, 
um, it's not aggressive actions, but um, yeah, very um, strong actions uh, to mitigate uh, adaptation uh, and also uh, calling for international corporations to have finance to help uh, countries, particularly developing countries, in the transition to greener economies. And I think and I agree with. Uh, uh, with David, uh, that the AFCFTA really offers a you know, big opportunity uh, to take this uh, opportunity to uh, frame all these efforts uh, in these human rights obligations, including the, uh, the, the access to a clean uh, environment. Thank you very much, Andrea. And, and just in the interest of time, I will take uh, one or two more questions. Um, David, perhaps, um, perhaps to you, might the sustainability and equity challenges of the multilateral trading system provide a basis for a new approach to negotiations on a, on a single undertaking basis that encompass both the so-called 21st century issues and the development issues in the Doha agenda? Yeah, um, thanks uh, for that, uh, that question, um, and Andreas. Um, uh, yes, I think, um, as we know, uh, the, uh, you know, currently, um, you know, there are very low expectations as to what can be achieved at the um, uh, WTO. I, I think we need to get out of this prism of uh, Doha versus new issues and so on, and to recognize that um, uh, much has happened during the last uh, 20 years. Uh, since um, uh, the door agenda was set. Uh, we live in a very different world. And I, I think anyone who doubts that uh, only needs to uh, look at uh, where we are um, uh, in 20, at the end of 2021 as to where we were at the beginning of uh, 2020 with the pandemic and, and, and all that. Uh, um, and I think we just need to uh, reset and, and, and start afresh. And um, I think one way of doing this is to look at um, uh, these issues of uh, sustainability, um, which is uh, an emergency on, on, on the planet in regard especially to climate, but also to look at it um, from the point of view of the WTO's own sustainability, its ability to be nimble, to be able to respond to new issues and to be able to uh, make new rules as um, new issues uh, emerge. Um, and we have seen that uh, this is not uh, happening. Um, I, in my intervention, I mentioned the, uh, the TRIPS waiver, uh, where there is evidence that yes, such a waiver could make a difference. Um, uh, you know, um, from the African continent, it's very clear uh, that um, we do need to ramp up uh, the production of vaccines. And, and there's evidence from at least a few companies in South Africa that uh, if the sharing of um, uh, patents, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the secrets related to production processes uh, could be uh, done, uh, they would be in a better position to uh, ramp up their own uh, production. So, you know, so the, there's scope for the WTO to be able to respond to in a nimble way to these uh, sorts of issues. Then on the other side is the equity aspect. Um, uh, and if we start with the premise, as I think uh, everyone does agree, that one size does not fit all, uh, then we need to look afresh at um, uh, how then to ensure that the derogations from general WTO rules uh, could be made in a way that uh, enhances uh, equity. I know that these are not easy issues to resolve, but um, uh, still, it, I think it's, it's possible. The genius behind the creation of the GATT system uh, is, is, still, is still there in, in, in many ways. And I think that same genius uh, can be applied to um, dealing with uh, the issues that we now face in a world that has moved and changed uh, radically since the GATT system was uh, introduced. So maybe I will stop here, but uh, but basically, yes, I think that we do need to be able to uh, reimagine the WTO that can deal with sustainability and, and deal with equity uh, at, at the same time. Thank you very much, David. And I know Carolyn had had one 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 final remark after that. And in the interest of time, if you can make that intervention as short as possible, Carolyn, so that we can go ahead with the closing remarks. Thank you, everyone. 
Okay, yes, thanks a lot. And I mean, this has been such a great discussion. So I'll thank everybody. I mean, the organizers, SES, um, David Luke, and yourself, Andres, and IASD, of course, for putting this together. Um, I've really appreciated it. And in fact, the reason I asked Andres for the floor was to actually unashamedly uh, plug our session tomorrow at the same time in the Trade and Sustainability Hub, in which we will talk about um, different sustainability impact assessment approaches. And I really do think it goes to the questions of, um, you know, th these different, whether we're talking about social, gender, human rights impact assessment, environmental impact assessment, biodiversity, it goes towards um, looking for the same aim. You know, if the trade system, where is it looking to go going forwards? Does a forward looking system mean new rules in new areas that we don't understand? Or is it to better understand how to formulate um, uh, rules and, and, and policies that work for everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Carolyn, and thank you to all our distinguished speakers and to our co-sponsors as well to the IISD colleagues that have made this possible. Uh, and it has been really a pleasure to be your moderator today. And now I pass on to, to Yvonne Bartman for um, closing remarks. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, all speakers, uh, for this uh, stimulating discussion. And I'm happy to hear, Caroline, that you are going to continue the discussion already tomorrow. Um, and um, I'm sure David and uh, Andrea, we will find ways uh, to also hold you responsible to continue this conversation. So I'm not going to sum up everything which was said, but maybe just highlight a few sentences uh, which in, yeah, impressed me most. I think the one thing is that Yes, we have core trade issues, but the trade community itself has been successful successful or partly successful in recent years to broaden this uh, perspectives. But however, uh, this process is still ongoing and needs to, uh, to be developed further. And I really liked uh, the term David uh, used uh, several times uh, to formulate a forward looking trade policy. Uh, with regard to the WTO and to reimagine a new WTO and to leave aside the stalemate uh, frustrating um, situation we have at the moment uh, at the organization. And of course, participation coming to the human rights uh, side or go more deeper to the human rights side, participation is a key element. And trade negotiators, I think, have to do their homework in a better way to be proactive and to see how the most vulnerable people can be better integrated in, the policy, in their policy formulation. And uh, the lens of human rights uh, is certainly very helpful in this regard to place people at the center in trade policy. And we have heard that there are already tools out there like human rights impact assessment, which can be very useful. Um, I think. Yeah, I think the time is almost up. So one last um, sentence would be that from what we've heard during the session, we could uh, definitely say that trade and human rights policy can become a happy couple. So we just need to fi uh, find ways where they meet more often, more regular to make this really a success. So thank you all very much. And um, we hope to continue this discussion with all of you. Goodbye. <laughs>